Hello and welcome to our latest Gower Society Youth Activity. And this month we are looking at hidden wildlife. One of the most abundant habitats which contains so much hidden wildlife is the salt marsh. So I'm here in North Gower and this salt marsh here is teeming with animals. And the best place to look for them is way out there in the mud flats. And all you can see at the surface is tiny little holes that's just a little bit of a sign for what's lying underneath. If you're looking for hidden wildlife, then you're looking for tracks and trails that tell you that an animal was there. You may not ever see the animal, but what you're doing is looking for clues to tell you that they visited that area. And in order to find that, you need some soft substrates or some soft ground so that when those animals move across it, they leave their footprints. You can also look for scat, which is their waste, so their poo. And again, that's a really good sign that those animals have been around. The other thing you can look is for signs of their feeding. Now, it could be that they've got teeth marks on the parts of the food that they haven't eaten, they've left behind. Or it could be that they've partially eaten something and left behind some droppings near it as well. So we're building up a picture of what this hidden wildlife is by bringing all the clues together. So in this activity, I'm going to show you a few of the hidden bits of wildlife that you can see if you get up at the right time of the day or if you leave out some traps and you carefully look at them if you take them into the daytime. But we're also going to think about what's hiding underneath. So underneath the mud, underneath the soil. Now, if you want to know more about what's hiding underneath the sand on the beach, then make sure you have a look at the Gower Society Youth rock pooling video on the Gower Society website or on the YouTube, the Nature Days YouTube channel. And that will tell you all about the ragworm, the lugworm, and of course the razor clams and show you how to find the signs of those and how to get them to come up so you can actually see them. So we're going to focus on those habitats which have got hidden animals in the daytime or maybe a different time of the day when you're not usually awake and see if we can bring some of that excitement from those hidden animals to you. So this is the start of the salt marsh. We've got the estuary here. So this is the Lucker estuary. So what happens is all that water, which is full of loads of particulates such as clay and silt, comes into the estuary. And when it comes in in the tide, eventually it will slow down. And when it slows down so much, it starts to deposit that material. So that clay and that silt starts to sink down and starts to spread and make mud flats. Now it has to be really slow for those tiny particles to actually settle. And this is an experiment you can do yourself. So you can use a comparison between three different habitats. You could use a salt marsh, so one full of clay and mud, and you can use what's in your garden or in a forest, and you could use the sand from the beach as well. Now those three different substrates, those three different grounds, if you put them into a bottle and fill it with water and give it a shake, and then put them next to each other and just wait and see which one settles first. Is it the soil full of organic matter? Or is it the sand full of rocks and shells? Or is it the mud flats, which is full of clay and silt? And as you watch them sink, you'll see that they start to create layers. And that's what happens in our floodplains here. And those layers trap things in between so you can get dead materials, a bit like old fossils, but in fact, they're the real remains of shells or dead animals and skeletons. But once this material has started to lay down, plants start to colonize it and they grow roots through it and they start to bind it together. And what we end up with is these little islands here. So these islands around me are the first beginnings of a salt marsh. So we've got our completely marine environment there, or a brackish environment there, where the river or the sea is making it wet all the time. Then here, this bit is exposed to the air for probably maybe an hour or so a day. 
And these plants here are adapted to be able to live underneath the water, but they've also got long roots to hold onto and to trap that material, that clay and that sand. And that starts to build this hidden habitat, which we're going to explore. Now, as these islands catch more and more of that sand and silt, they grow and grow and grow. And eventually one little island will join with another little island to make a big island. And in between it, you'll have a creek. Now we've got a really big creek here, which is draining the water out from the salt marsh back there and back into the estuary. But it's also bringing up seawater when the tide is in and it's flooding the back of the salt marsh that way. Now, as those islands get bigger and bigger and there's less and less creeks in between, you get more and more perfectly flat land and higher and higher. So it's higher above the high tide, which means it gets un inundated by salt water less and less. So more and more different plants get to colonize it. A bit like in the rocky shore, we've got what's called zonation. We've got plants here that don't mind being outside in the air for maybe an hour, but really need the salt water to survive. And then at the other end of the salt marsh, you've got plants that don't want to get too salty or too wet, and they can be in the air for maybe 23 hours a day. So they're really a terrestrial plant. So in amongst that clay and that silt, you have all those creatures that can hide away from predators, but every day get a new source of food as the tide brings in all those particulate matter, which includes organic matter, so some waste products from some other animals, but also tiny microscopic plants like phytoalgae and zooplankton as well, and phytoplankton, and all this is gonna provide them with food. So when the tide comes in, they shoot up their feeding tentacles or some siphons or something so they can suck in the water and they can then filter out the animals or plants they want to eat. However, when the tide goes out, they need to stay hidden because that's when their predators come. That's when the birds, and you'll see loads of birds in the salt marsh and the, and the mud flats because they can fly in land where they think there's going to be lots of tasty animals and then inside that mud they can look for animals. Now I say look but they're hidden so they can't see them so they must have some other sense. It could be that like us they are looking for signs in the mud to see where they should dig. It could be that they've got a beak which is sensitive to vibrations so that when they put it into the mud they can feel if there's something down there. The other thing that's amazing about these creatures living underneath the mud is that they feel that they're safe but in fact the birds have done a really clever thing. They have evolved to be able to reach them and you've got a range of animals living here, a range of birds which have got a range of different shapes and size beaks so they can reach the different animals that live at different depths hidden underneath here. And that I think is fascinating. The fact that you might have a tiny bivalve or a little snail that's saying, oh, I've sorted, I've outwitted those birds, I'm not gonna be eaten, I'm really far down. And the bird goes, oh, it's all right, I'm just gonna grow a really, really long beak. And that's what they've done. So that's another really clever experiment that you can have a go at. You can try and be these birds. Now it's your turn. What you need for this challenge is to get three different containers which are of different height and put something inside the containers. I'm gonna use stones, but you could use Lego bricks or you could use Play-Doh or you could use anything at all really that's small enough to sit into the bottom of your pots. Then you need to take your chopsticks and you're going to try and see if you can pick up that stone from each of the containers. Ooh. And see which one is the hardest. Yay. Now, if you're struggling using chopsticks, you can always tie them together with an elastic band to help, or you can use tweezers or clothes pegs. Now, if you find it nice and easy, then why don't you try it again, but this time 
with your eyes closed. Because that, of course, is what it's like with the birds. They can't see what they're looking at. So see if you can pick it up then. Not so easy now. If you've got some sand, a really good activity you can do as well is get some sand into a tub. So it could be a bucket. Hide inside the bucket some Lego or some marbles or something. It could even be shells. Now, there's no sign on the surface to tell us that those animals are living underneath our mud. You can then use your chopsticks to try and locate those items using the end of the chopstick to try and feel your way like the birds have to. You can use chopsticks, you could use tweezers. Yay! Or you could use pegs. And see who can find the animals, so who can be the best wading birds. So here we've got some nice prints, we've got some bird prints. So we're going to follow those and see if they take us and tell us what the bird has been doing. They might take us to where it's been feeding in amongst the mud so we can see what's hidden underneath. Let's see if we can see what's hiding in amongst these holes. Oh, see the water bubbling? That's a good sign. Oh, and all those holes appearing. Just look at all those signs left by the animals that are living in amongst the mud. We've got holes, we've got tubes made by worms or by some siphons. Come here, mister. Oh, I don't want to hurt you. There. So this ragworm, one of the animals making and living in those holes. You see he's a ragworm because he's got cilia going down his sides. Looks like he's got loads of legs, but obviously he's a worm, so he has no legs. So maybe hundreds of those living in one bit of this mud. Nice bit of food for something with a right shaped beak. Oh, lots of holes there. Oh, there we go. So now you can see hidden underneath. So that's our Venus shell there living. That's its siphon tube hole. And then these others are probably worms. We've got another bivalve there. So under every tube, there's going to be an animal. Lots of hidden wildlife known and used only by the birds. Now, this is a very different footprint going into the woodland here. Now this could be one of two animals. It could be a sheep or it could be a deer. So we're going to follow its trail to see if we can see any more signs or clues as to who made this footprint. So now we have some scat. Now this is poo. And of course, if you're picking up poo, you've got to make sure you wash your hands afterwards. So we've got a few bits, pellets of poo here. We've been following our trail, so it might belong to the thing, the animal that was the trail of, but we can use certain thing characteristics to identify our scat, our poo. Okay, so if you look at this poo, it's quite angular. So it's got flat sides. And that's because when these poos are pooed, 
They are very, very soft and as they come out, they are squished. So it looks a bit like a dice with lots and lots of, of faces. This means that this is a sheep's poo. And this is a winter sheep's poo because they are separate from each other. If this was a deer poo, I'm going to try and make you a deer poo out of a sheep's poo. Then we need to take away all of those faces, turn it more into a bean shaped, is that a bean? And then we have a pointier end. So if you find them more like that shape, rounded, no faces, then we've got a deer poo. If you find it with weird flat bits, corners, etc., we've got domestic sheep's poo. In the summertime, because their diet slightly is better, they squish together and we end up with all these poos clumping together en masse and they make long sausages of little pellets of poo and that's what you get in the summertime and again you can tell how flat they are and how angular they are whether it's going to be our sheeps or our deer. So our signs so far we've been following some footprints which look like sheep or deer footprints we followed that, it's gone underneath wood and we saw wool but underneath the wood and now we found some scat or some poo and this is our sheep's poo. So we have been tracking a sheep, not very hidden but those are the systematic ways in which you would follow some hidden wildlife and we could have ended up finding some deer. So if you want to know if you've got deer you're obviously not going to find wool but if you find hairs, if you break those hairs in half then they snap very easily because they're hollow. So if you want to find deer hair, then if you find anything underneath the logs, obviously, again, think about where they're going. If they're going underneath a branch, which is quite low down, then you've got a small animal. If you're thinking about tracking a badger, then they can crawl under a, a very low branch. So you've got to consider how they're moving as well along the ground. So get down to that eye level. I'm going to go wash my hands now. A really good sign that you can look for when you're looking for hidden wildlife is to look for animal scat or their poo. Now we've got here not some poo but actually a toilet or a latrine that's been dug by an animal, a very clean animal that doesn't want to do its business next to where it's sleeping so it actually goes a little bit away from where it's living, digs itself a nice hole and then does a poo inside that. This hole here is very square and that means that this hole has been made by a badger. So badgers do their business in a latrine, which is a little way away from their set. And they always do a number of these, but I don't think this has been used for a while because I can't see any poo inside it. And if you look at the other ones that we've got over here, you can see that that's also full of leaves and there's no mess in there. Badger poo is very, very obvious as well. It basically looks like they've got diarrhoea. So it's not long and it's not sausage shaped. It's like a big squirt. So it's very obvious. So if you find square holes, almost perfectly square holes, which are made by the shape of their paws, then that is, if it's got something inside it that looks like a bit of diarrhoea, then you've probably got the signs that there's a badger set nearby. And if you have a look around you, Best way to do some tracking to look for signs of animals that are close to the ground like badgers is you need to get down to their eye level. So when you get down to their eye level, you might see along the ground a space which might have been one of their runs. So that is the road that they take back to their, either their feeding ground or back to their home, to their set. And they always use the same road. So they end up getting worn out quite often. And badgers are quite low to the ground. So they literally, their stomachs can rub along so it's quite a wide track that you might see. Now, if you've got a ground area which hasn't got lots of materials like I've got here, say it's made out of grass, you can see that they've flattened the grass and the grass will look a different colour to the grass next to it because it's all been flattened and one side of the leaves will be up, up to the surface and that will be a slightly different colour to the rest of the leaves which are in lots of different directions. So it's very obvious to see those tracks. Yeah. And we've got another one run here and this is actually coming directly from the latrine. So you could actually follow these runs and see if you can find your way back to the badger's set. So another really easy sign of um, hidden wildlife is, of course, molehills. So molehills are an indicator we've got moles under the ground, but the chance of you seeing that mole is very unlikely. But also, if you look into the distance along here, there is actually an animal track going along here as well. It's only about this wide, 
you can see it there. Now, obviously, that's not a mole track. Moles are under the ground, and they're also tiny. But something has been musing this, which is either that wide, either their body if they're low down, or their feet are using uh, that wide. So you can see that there is an animal track along here. So this could be part of our badger track. We've got some more scat here. This is bird droppings. And this, is, of course, has come from above. So don't forget, when you're looking for signs, look down, but also look up. So if we look around us here, we've got bird poo all the way around these trees. And so if you actually look up, you can follow the source and see we have a rookery with a bird's nest at the top there. And the rooks are actually coming in to roost now. So there we go. There's the source of our hidden wildlife, our rooks in their rookery, and they've left us a sign of their scat. Other clues are found in feeding signs, such as piles of nuts that have been half eaten. If you look very closely at any discarded food, you can usually tell what's eaten it by teeth marks. If you do find a hoard of nuts underneath your hazel tree or in amongst your wood, then you might be able to work out what hidden wildlife has been eating it by looking at the way it's been eaten. So these ones here have got tiny little tooth marks along the edge. And we can tell by the size of those and also the location of them, whether they're on the outside of the nut or on the inside of the nut, which animal has actually been eating it. If you look in comparison to this nut, this nut here has got a very smooth edge with no teeth marks because it's actually been split. It's used its chisel-like teeth to actually split the nut in half. And this means that this nut has been split and eaten by a squirrel. Whereas this one here with the teeth marks on the surface here, on the outside surface, has been eaten by a wood mouse. So if you look very closely at the marks on the edge of the hole made by the small mammal, especially with a magnifying glass, if they are on the outside of the hole, then this has been made by a wood mouse because they hold it so that their mouth with their big incisors on the outside and their lower jaw on the inside, and they make these marks on the outside. So you have these tiny little incisor marks made on the outside, which makes it a wood mouse. However, bank voles hold the nut like this. And once they've made a hole, they get their head inside and they put their upper jaw on the inside. So their big incisor is on the inside of the nut and the lower jaw on the outside. So if you look inside, if you see tooth marks on the inside of the hole, then that's been made by a bank vole. Now, one of the hidden wildlife events that you have, of course, is very, very noisy, but it's very hidden because you have to get up very early in the morning to be able to hear it. And that's the dawn chorus. The reason birds sing so early in the morning is because it's too dark for them to search for food but it's also too dark for them to be spotted by predators. So this makes it the perfect time for them to sing. And also as there's less background noise, and also usually in the morning, the air is quite still and the wind hasn't started yet. So sound carries up to 20 times further than it would later in the day. What's amazing is that the birds actually start their singing at different times. So it's almost like hearing an orchestra of the different bird songs. So usually starting with the robins, then the blackbirds, and then the thrushes. And then later on, they're joined by things like the wood pigeons, the wrens, and the warblers. And then later on, you have the tits, the blue tits, the great tits, and the sparrows and finches that come on just as the light is about to be seen.
something truly magical about hearing the dawn chorus. And I think it's the fact that when you're out there, it's completely encompassing you. It's like surround sound. So from every direction. So you can't really get that from a recording. Every single way around me, there are hundreds of birds talking to each other. So I do recommend if you can get out really early before the sun comes up, and if you can do this in March, then you don't have to get up that early. Get up, get outside, and just wrap up warm and just listen. Now the dawn chorus is a sign of spring. And the best time to see it is spring is because what we've got is those birds are trying to prove that they are the strongest of their species. So it's usually the males that are singing, and of course the louder they are, the more chance they have of attracting a mate, a female. They're also defending their territories so that nobody else comes in to nest by them. So during spring, from March, that is when you'll get the best dawn chorus. But of course, the days are getting longer, so the dawn chorus gets earlier and earlier. So if you go in March, you only have to get up at six in the morning. But if you're getting up to hear it in May, you may have to get up at five or half four in the morning to be able to hear that dawn chorus. But it always starts about an hour before sunrise. So if you want to find out when sunrise is, if you look at the Met Office website, then you can find out what time the sun's going to rise in your area. Get up a bit before that. If you can get out first before dawn chorus starts, so an hour before sunrise, first of all you'll hear just one or two birds, maybe the blackbird, like we heard, maybe some robins, you can really distinctly hear them apart. So that's a really good time to try and home in on what bird it is using an app. Then they all start to join in. And of course the loudest ones are the ones that are going to win their mates. So it's a fantastic opportunity to hear all those birds that are living in your garden. And as they all join together, they're showing that they are collectively strong because, of course, you need to outcompete the other bird to be able to be heard. Also, if you think about it, they've had a cold night. They haven't eaten yet that morning. So they're showing they're really strong because they can do this on an empty stomach. So it's a really good moment for the females to see if they're going to provide them with really strong offspring. So they're still singing now, but I think pretty much the sun is up dawn chorus has finished so those birds are going to try and find some food now so I'm going to go and put some food out for them the dawn chorus doesn't last very long so once the sun's come up you can go back to bed